The Kentucky Historical Society was founded in 1836, but did you know that it soon lapsed? Join us today for a discussion with the KHS Research Fellow, who has written an article examining the origins of the Kentucky Historical Society, and who explains why it struggled to survive as an institution in the 19th century, as we explore the pages of Kentucky history with Kentucky Chronicles. Kentucky Chronicles is inspired by the work of researchers from across the world who have conducted research at the Kentucky Historical Society, or who have contributed to the Scholarly Journal, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, which has been published continuously since 1903. Hi, I'm Daniel J. Burge, the host of Kentucky Chronicles, a podcast of the Kentucky Historical Society. I'm the associate editor of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, and I also coordinate our research fellows program, which brings in researchers from across the world to conduct research in the rich archival holdings of the Kentucky Historical Society. Dr. Derek Kane O'Leary holds a PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. He has received numerous fellowships from across the United States, which have allowed him to spend time at Mount Vernon, Harvard University, and the Massachusetts Historical Society. Dr. O'Leary has published several articles, including The Historical Society Has Removed to Massachusetts, Edward Jarvis and the First Kentucky Historical Society. This is in the winter 2023 issue of The Register. We are quite excited to have him with us today. Welcome, Derek. So for this podcast, we've been talking with folks who are at various stages of their career. I know I gave a brief introduction, but could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your main areas of interest are? Uh, yeah, sure, Daniel. And, and you know, thanks again for taking the time to talk with me today and about this article. Uh, so I, I focus on the process of building archives and constructing historical narratives in the early United States. So in, in many cases, that's like a very mundane process of paper by paper, artifact by artifact, building these collections, uh, often housed within historical societies like the KHS, sometimes in more personal collections or governmental collections, and then the ways in which those materials were used to bolster historical narratives, um, which didn't always line up with each other, which were shifting during this early period, contested by, by different actors, uh, as certain Americans in these positions of authority went about the process of constructing a history for the nation as they saw it. So I've been working on that in a series of articles, including this new one with the, the Register, uh, which I, I was so excited to write after my experience there last year, and as part of a book manuscript, um, which is in, in the hands of a, a wonderful editor at, at UVA Press now, and we're, we're working towards, um, uh, you know, getting that, getting that fit for <laughs> for uh, their board. So uh, that, that's that's where I am. And, you know, this this story, which I know we're going to talk about um, with Edward Jarvis and the Kentucky Historical Society, fits into that larger scope of Americans in these early decades um, building national collections and stories about themselves. And I think that's one of the cool things about the podcast is we've gotten to talk to scholars at different levels, some who are talking about their book projects specifically, but also articles, which I think is really important um, for our listeners to get a sense of, okay, sometimes folks work on the bigger projects, sometimes they splinter off into smaller projects. Sometimes those smaller projects for us, it's every bit as interesting as sort of the larger project um, that you're working on at the time. So it's, it's cool to have those opportunities. And, and not to get us off track, but I, I think that's such a great point and one that I've, I've been interested in for years, like going through the PhD and since, it's just like which is the which is the medium or the genre in which we express different ideas at different points. And you know, I spent years involved with an intellectual history blog in which thousand to fifteen hundred word essays were the norm and began thinking at the point at which um, you know shorter shorter articles, uh, ideas turn into bigger ones and support these larger book size projects. And so, you know, it's great, I think, for people to have opportunities to write on these different scales. I think it's a good skill set to have as well, in the sense that I know for myself, and I can sort of speak to this a little bit, the encouragement is always, okay, focus on the book, focus on the book. Mm -hmm. But there is a different audience that you can hit if you splinter that off, or if, if you go on sort of a different path. And it's hard 
because as you mentioned, you're dealing with all the revisions and thinking about, okay, here's the book project. But then you got to sort of spin that around and go, okay, but now I need to devote, you know, however much time it takes to do an article or to do a blog. And those things are time consuming still. I mean, that still eats into your time. That's not something you just sort of rattle off really quickly. You still have a lot of expertise that goes into each and every one of those projects. It's true, but those, you know, it, you know, this, this kind of conversation is a testament to it. Our, our projects that often will reach a larger public and reach it sooner than a book project will. And I think this is not, not to get down the rabbit hole of what's going on in higher education uh, too much, but there are how many thousands of history PhD dissertations out there that mm -hmm. are, are lost in ProQuest or somewhere else and have, have never really met the public uh, and gotten the, you know, the readership that they deserve. So I think that's, that's kind of the other, the other side of, you know, how we publish and when we publish. Oh, definitely. So to go back to the first question and sort of your answer to that one, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you're looking at archives and, and that sort of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to KHS and specifically sure. what you were looking at when you came to the Kentucky Historical Society? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and I talk a bit about this in, in the article, so it's connected with that. Uh, so much of the writing about archives, about historical consciousness, about the writing of history, historiography in the early U.S. tends to focus on eastern cities, Massachusetts and, you know, Boston and, and Worcester, where you have major historical um, societies in these years, uh, New York, um, and New England, and the mid-Atlantic coast in general. And, you know, a, a reason for that um, is, in part, the influence that they bore on how Americans thought about history. And, and you mentioned in, in your intro to this most recent edition of the, the Register, uh, Washington Irving, you know, a New Yorker, uh, you know, uh, who had a big influence on, on New York's understanding of its history. Um, but but the other reason for that is that just there's so much more material for historical societies, for the writing of history in that early period. So there's more for historians to draw on and understanding that. And I think that kind of narrows our telling of this larger story of how Americans were thinking about history in these years. So I, I kind of fall in not prey to that, but I've been gravitating towards those institutions uh, as I did this research. And I was just eager to expand things to, to see to what extent a Western, you know, in the mm -hmm. geographical imagination of the time, a Western historical society in Kentucky could tell us about this bigger, this bigger story. Would it resemble what was going on kind of east of the Appalachian Mountains? Would it tell a different story? Uh, how can we bring this this history of, of Western historical societies, archives, and historical consciousness kind of into the broader national landscape. And so I was drawn to, to KHS, and you just happened to have a wonderful uh, fellowship, not to flatter you too much, but this wonderful uh, visiting fellows program. Oh, and I appreciate the shout out for that, and also that you read the introduction, because um, it's, always, it's always fun to craft those introductions for each issue. Um, Stefan and I sort of divide them up, and it's it's fun to do. It's also challenging to sort of figure out how to introduce articles, but also to get the idea of, okay, what is the sort of central thrust of this one in particular? But I also think the topic is really fascinating mm -hmm. because as historians, we oftentimes we're aware of the historiography, but we sometimes don't investigate it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think we know that archives are there and that we need them. Mm -hmm. But as historians, we oftentimes sort of overlook the fact that they have their own histories. So that's what I loved about your project in particular is that you're going, okay, not only do these archives hold histories, they are a history in a sense. And in the, in the, how do we choose what we collect? Why do we collect what we collect? Why do we do what we do? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's a great way to encapsulate it. And in the case of the Kentucky Historical Society, though, there have been a number of attempts to tell its early history. And, and like, those are, those are helpful. And I, I uh, refer to them in the article. It, hasn't been explored in the way that other historical societies have explored their early histories for for some obvious reasons there just aren't a lot of materials on it it was briefly lived but uh i think and there's more to say about this it's the brevity of it that's worth explaining as well it's and, and this is just a question for historians in general it's it's the absence of it uh which which is an interesting topic of, of analysis too so i was i was eager to dig into that 
Which sort of segues perfectly into the next question. We haven't had a lot, as you mentioned, of fellows do a deep dive into the institutional history of KHS. But for those who aren't familiar and for those who might check out the article at a later point in time, can you give us sort of a brief synopsis um, in just in the sense of how does KHS get started? Who are we talking about? What sure. time period? What what documents are they looking at? So the Kentucky Historical Society was was relatively late to the scene uh, among this really like this blossoming of a historical society movement in the antebellum U.S. So you had a few precursors in the 1790s, uh, the 1800s, the first decade of the century. Uh, in the East, and then this, this real explosion of historical society formation in the 1820s. And, and so Kentucky is a little bit on the tail end of that. Uh, and it comes into formation um, in the second half of the 1830s as a, a first kind of um, like uh, unsuccessful attempt to bring it together in 1836 uh, among some kind of elite Kentuckians themselves. And then it's only the next year in 1837 that it really gets off the ground. And it's through this interesting merging of peoples. Uh, on one hand, uh, Kentuckians who have been there for at this point, maybe two generations or so. So some of them themselves are among what they call the pioneer period. Um, so they're they're kind of later in life. Others are you know first generation um, descendants of those. They tend to hold kind of positions of power and authority within life in Kentucky, whether that's law or agriculture and business or politics. On the other hand, you have these interlopers, these guys from the east, mostly from New England, uh, as I discussed in the article, from a certain caste. A certain cultural caste. They've they've gone, many of them to elite schools, other elite institutions. Uh, they are occupying kind of positions of like re relative authority uh, in the East, and for different reasons, they've decided to move to Kentucky uh, to seek better fortunes. In some cases, to to kind of put their imprint on this new newish state by their standards. And they bring with them this notion of the historical society in a way. They, they've understood what a historical society is because they've, they've seen them in you know Massachusetts or Connecticut, wherever they're hailing from. And so they have an idea of how these institutions are supposed to function. And so you have these kind of newcomers from a from somewhat lower social class compared to the more elite Kentuckians who they're engaging with around the formation of this historical society. And you can see that in the early membership and the early uh, officers who lead the organization, a combination of, of guys like Edward Jarvis uh, from Massachusetts or Leonard Bliss also from Massachusetts. And then these kind of more eminent Kentuckians like John Rowan and others. Uh, and that's the sort of interesting combination of folks who come together and say, we, we need to collect the materials for the history of this state, but they're coming at it from different vantage points. And that uh, might be the source of its um, kind of ill-fated first first attempt to stay in, to stay in business. It's such an interesting cast of characters too. I know we'll talk more about Jarvis, but the fact that Bliss just ends up getting gunned down in the yeah. streets is just one of those facts. You dropped it in the article and it just made me laugh because I'm like, who is this guy? Yeah. And, and and like not, not an auspicious start for, uh, historical society leaders. Um, it's, it's become hopefully a less violent life yes. a, a Kentucky Historical Society uh, employee these days. But, you know, that was a reflection of, um, you know, it, you know, to put it charitably like culture of honor or, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a sort of vengeance killing for a perceived slight. Um, but also, I, I think you're right, a good encapsulation of this encounter between um, young men uh, from Eastern states uh, Bliss was a, a newspaper man and published a, a large number of historical documents from the Kentucky pioneer period uh, through the popular press on one hand, and then this, you know, this this other newer society in Kentucky uh, in this kind of these booming, booming cities, frontier cities on the other. It would definitely make you think twice about what you printed in your newspaper, though, <laughs> if, if you were worried about sort of the repercussions being that serious and, and that you could, you know, have an encounter. I mean, it is, it is an interesting time and a really interesting cast of characters. And that's why I will encourage everyone to check out the article because we're gonna talk more about Jarvis um, coming up. 
But it's a really interesting group of individuals who do this, and the reasons why it falls apart so quickly is fascinating. But to get to get back on track a little bit here, you talk a lot in the article about Edward Jarvis. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners, can you just explain who he was, what brought him to Kentucky, and sort of why he's so pivotal Sure. to the story of the Kentucky Historical Society. Well, I think this this does segue well from your previous question and, and interest in like the individuals, um, because Jarvis is one of the individuals like within the broader context of collecting historical societies, archives in this period, who just had an, a disproportionate influence on the materials that were collected. And he's one of like a kind of a set of people who I explore in the book uh, who leave their mark on these institutions and who we should pay attention to because we see in their their decisions uh, about what to collect what not to collect how to preserve it how to present it to the public uh, an indication of just how contingent these institutions are how contingent our historical record was and continues to be which for the researcher for the the, the reader for the public is is important to to recognize as, as you were saying earlier that these collections and institutions don't come ready-made. They're mm -hmm. individuals making choices uh, within their, their limited capacity at, at points in time. And so Jarvis, Jarvis is an interesting guy, and we, we have access into his world because he wrote about himself a lot. Uh, he kept a diary in his early life in, in Concord, Massachusetts, and, and the neighborhood where he grew up. Uh, he, he went to Harvard um, in the early 1800s, decided to become a physician, um, struggled to kind of attain the status that he hoped for himself. Um, you know, especially coming out of Harvard in that period of time, he, he aspired to a certain stature in his community and didn't quite get there and felt a certain amount of resentment that he wasn't quite getting the reception and the, the respect and the success that he hoped for in Massachusetts. Uh, though, though as he struggled through that, he demonstrated these traits, these kind of inclinations that he would bring with him when he migrated to Kentucky in the 1830s. Uh, he was like a very busy civic individual. He joined every other organization that Concord, Massachusetts had. He worked for the library. Uh, he worked in a, a, the, the Lyceum, so the, the place where people would come to lecture on this or that topic. Uh, he joined Sunday schools and taught there. He, he, he did everything. He was like, like the kid in high school who joined every single club yes. uh, and, and really like gave it, gave it his all. Um, though simultaneously was concerned about how he was perceived. Um, though he saw this as a responsibility, he, he was concerned with his perception in the community. Um, but he, he didn't have that professional success. And so he like myriad other young men uh, aspiring to something more in these years, he, he left. And he left his wife too, which was hard, who, who he loved and communicated with throughout these years. And he decided to go to Louisville and set up shop there, uh, hang up his shingle and try to make more money in this newer state where he thought there might be a dearth of of physicians. And so that's what he does. And you know, he very quickly, once he arrives in Louisville, builds the sort of busy civic life that he knew back home. He joins literary and philosophical societies. He joins uh, the medical college and uh, local hospital. He gets involved. He gets his hands into the city's civic life right away. Uh, and that includes participating in the creation of the Kentucky Historical Society. So it wasn't a one-off uh, interest in associational life. It was part of his broader interest in civic engagement, building up the institutions of this city, as he had been doing back home, though now he's in a different context, a, a newer city with a uh, newer population, uh, less developed institutions. And so he ends up taking on a bigger role in the Kentucky Historical Society than he ever could have in Massachusetts, for instance, which had a much more developed and uh, established historical society. And so he kind of, he works together with uh, this cast of other officers in these early years. And by 1838, 1839, kind of rises to the, the leadership position. Though he's the librarian, but he, uh, at least by his own account, is by far the most active. Mm -hmm. 
uh, person. Though, though just, just to kind of reiterate what I was saying before about the contingent nature of these collections, most of the evidence we have and most that I could draw on from the article are from Jarvis himself. Uh, the accounts that he wrote of himself and his participation in his diary uh, for the public. And so we, we do have to take it with a certain grain of, of salt. I think it would be really interesting, and I know the sources are limited for this, but to see what other people thought of him Yes. in the sense of he seems kind of like a busybody. He loves getting involved in everything. And I think that it seems to be his personality. I would love if others sort of appreciated that fact and were like, oh, he's a go-getter. Or if they're like, oh, Edward Jarvis, what is he doing? I, 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 just, I think that'd be interesting. It's a great question. And I, if anyone finds more evidence uh, about that, I'd, I'd love to see it. Uh, you know, we, we have some indications. Uh, he was one very successful in building up a lot of materials very, very quickly, which he, he we don't have a catalog. The materials were dispersed and inserted into other collections after the society collapsed, basically, in the 1840s. Um, but, but we have some indications, you know, people didn't show up for meetings often enough, like they couldn't reach a quorum for a meeting, so they had to lower the, the level of the quorum. And why weren't people showing up is a kind of a, a question that Jarvis is concerned with as well, but maybe they just they just didn't want to go. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to know quite how he was received, though he, he was kind of an integral to a lot of other institutions in the city, and so, you know, had a, had a meaningful role there. Well. And I think that was one of the really enjoyable things about your article is that you get a sense of the um, institution building of the 19th century and how pivotal organizations were to folks in the mid 19th century and how they saw that, or at least those who were engaged sort of civically, okay. they saw that as a big part of life. Like I really got the sense that Jarvis misses that in sort of his New England way. He, he misses what he had. And part of that is I'm going to recreate it but part of it's, uh, it's it's hard to recreate what you had growing up and, and sort of what he felt connected to. A absolutely. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a broader phenomenon in this period, as you know, you know, kind of famously de Tocqueville, in, in, who's, who's visiting the U.S. and then publishing his Democracy in America during these very years. He comments on Americans' associational instincts to, to build associations. I, I think, we, you know, we live in a America where this continues to be the case today. Uh, the individual responsibility that people take on to, to build things. And, and Jarvis is definitely part of that. He's also definitely part of this larger movement of guys, you know, usually white men, middle or, or kind of more aspiring uh, social class who, who move westward and do just what you're describing, build up institutions which resemble those that they've known. And it's not its not always a, a successful story for them. And the Kentucky Historical Society is not the only Western Historical Society to um, lapse, to fall apart during these years. Which uh, yeah. I think is almost, I don't want to say it's the most interesting part, but tracing it, what I found to be really interesting was not only, okay, here's this group of individuals who come together, but this is sort of why it was so difficult to do, which does bring me to my, my next question is, what causes the downfall or the lapse of the first Kentucky Historical Society? Like, what is it that, that leads to people just looking at, upon it in a sort of an apathetic way where we really don't care if we gather anymore or, or who cares if our collections go away? What triggers that or what leads to that? Well, if you ask Jarvis, he would say, he left. <laughs> yes, he did in 1841. He went back to Massachusetts, and uh, he said that he kind of took the historical society with him, in a sense. And to an extent, that's true, and shows the damn inordinate influence that one person had on this institution, um, which is the case of other historical societies in these years as well. A few kind of motivating, galvanizing individuals. They they die or they leave or or whatever, and the momentum stops. So in part, it's that. Uh, in part, it's a broader phenomenon. And if we, we take Jarvis and others kind of seriously as sort of proto-ethnographers of like what's going on in Kentucky uh, culture and society, uh, he would say that they just didn't have a spirit of preservation. It was just not part of the culture, of the kind of constitution of people in that place. And that's kind of an interesting thing 
to think about. I, I, you know, I think I think most people would say, well, to to remember and to narrate is a human instinct. It, it's something which we, we see across cultures and times in different fashions. Um, but to engage in the specific activities of gathering certain papers, to believe that one as an individual has a responsibility, as, as Jarvis and any other historical society officer would have said in these years, to donate important materials. Uh, usually text, but also some artifacts as well. Uh, to, to learn those practices is culturally contingent. Uh, you have to you have to learn how to do it or be taught how to do it, to feel a certain um, external or internal motivation to do so. And, you know, I think we see that in, in the decline of the historical society. Um, there were condition, material conditions in Kentucky that made it hard to build up a lot of materials. There was just less paper. There was a, a shorter, um, history of, if we're just thinking of history in the sense of conquest and settlement by European descended Americans, there was a shorter history from which to draw texts, and, and that is how they thought about history at the time. Uh, and so there's less stuff, but there's also less of this kind of cultivated instinct to preserve stuff, which you had uh, mainstream to a far greater extent in a place like Massachusetts, where Jarvis came from, or, or Connecticut, or New York, or, or some of the other individuals there came from. And so I think it shows us that as well, that we, we learn certain practices of how we handle historical materials. And I think that that's true to this day in, in the work of historical societies today, that you, you all, if I may say so, are engaged in the work of, of mediating between people and the historical record. And it's teaching or guiding people to understand the historical record in a certain way. And I think Jarvis arrived in a context where they just had a different relationship than the one he was he was anticipating. And I think it's so interesting because when we look at historical societies today, we think, okay, why is this collection so good? Or why does this institution have so many sources on the 19th century? Or if the state goes back farther, sort of, okay, why do they have all these collections? Sometimes we don't think about just the conditions of the times, the difficulty of collecting, having the institutions in place, all of those things that you're talking about. I mean, those are really important things that I think sometimes we're here and we go, oh, we have these collections. It's good to know, okay, why do we have the collections that we have? What do they tell us? Because you're, you're absolutely, they shape our narratives. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right with that. Like the sources that we have, historians can use those and then that, that, that shapes how we view history. They, they shape our narratives and I think you know what what Jarvis shows and what you can see in any other uh, early historical society and archival collection is that those archives themselves are actively shaped to support certain narratives and, and so you know the, the kind of the most important aspect of this in the context of Kentucky which you know was kind of conquered and settled and developed very quickly within the lifetime of many of these individuals is is how to treat the historical record of Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, in, including the the kind of um, what are referred to at the time as Indian mounds these earthen and, earth and architectural remains of um, previous Native American inhabitants and you know for the Kentucky Historical Society as for many others the kind of history starts with the textual record um, whereas oral traditions uh, other types of evidence and authority ha have less of a place to play uh, and that's what you can see in in the materials that Leonard Bliss publishes in which I mentioned in the article he's publishing from the very earliest diary that they have of the, the settlement of Kentucky in the in the 1770s. And it's it's going back to that first text, um, which they're so interested in, um, but not just because it's the first text, but because it supports a story that they want to tell. So there's a sort of dialectic, like this back and forth between um, the materials and the narrative. And you know, sometimes the, the sense of what the narrative is supposed to be influences the materials that you you go and look for. It means that you're not looking for other materials. Yes, um, which does perfectly lead into this question. Um, what sort of lessons can we draw from the story of the failures of the first Kentucky Historical Society? Reading the article, talking with you about it, having seen this project mature and develop, you can sort of see how, how people are shaped, but also how the story sort of develops. So can you draw a lesson from it or is there something you can tell from it or is it just that, that we do need to be more reflective on the origins of historical societies 
that we're, so many of us are an active part of today or that we use? It's a great question. I, I guess it would, it would depend on you know, a story, for, a lesson for whom, a uh, story from, from which perspective. I, I think for, for just thinking of, of researchers of American history, uh, and I, I know the KHS may, like, reaches a pretty wide audience within Kentucky, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, it's approaching the historical record with a critical eye and always wondering like how it got there. Uh, being, being curious about the forces that led to the creation of the historical record that we have and that enabled it to be preserved. And you know, as you said earlier, seeing that as part of the history as well. And then of course, factoring that in when we make interpretations of that history. I think the other the other thing and you know kind of within our our ongoing context of uh discussions to to you know put it generally about what American history is, what materials and actors constitute it to see ourselves, which is to say that uh whether we we choose to preserve or not to preserve, when we choose to to commemorate or not to commemorate, we're always making meaningful choices that influence the, the nation's historical record and, and whether it's the material record itself or our relationship with it, we're, we're all active participants in this process. And, and when I teach about history, I, I think, and for other teachers, I think this is a, an exciting avenue because it gives students an opportunity to see themselves as part of a, an ongoing, often contentious, uh, always dynamic process of figuring out what that record is and, and how we make sense of it. And so the, the KHS is kind of an extreme example of one person's attempt to do that in these early years and, and kind of what happened when, when it fell apart. But I think it reflects this larger, this larger story. I know for me personally, I think from the public history angle, mm -hmm. it really made me a bit more reflective. I mean, I've, I've researched a lot of historical societies. I've been to a lot of them, but I had never really thought about the historical context of why did they develop? Why are some of them seemingly um, have more sources, are more sources that were useful to me. What about those collections? So I think even as a public historian, for me personally, it really made me think through those issues that I hadn't thought of um, to that same extent. I don't think I could approach a historical society in the same way, just because it, it's not neutral in that sense of, okay, here's sources. There's a reason why we have the collections that we have. And as historians, you know, we do have to make certain decisions when we write, but at the same time, it's good to be reflective of that. And I think that's that's the great thing with this article and this talk today. Well, yeah, th thanks for saying so. And, uh, you know, I think that that's an important part of graduate training or for, for anyone who's approaching the study of history is to just always think critically about our relationship with the material base and the narratives that we have about it. Which does lead me to my last and sort of fun question that I always sure. like to ask. So. What was the most surprising, enjoyable, interesting, or noteworthy thing that happened on your trip to Kentucky? Or put differently, was there something about Kentucky that you found interesting that might have nothing at all to do with your academic research? I know our fellows come from a wide variety of places, so sometimes it's just surprising or something just surprises you when you get here. Yeah, well, I, I'll say two things maybe. One, more in the category of, of flattering the KHS um, and Kentucky in general. You know, I, I didn't know very much about Kentucky history, um, didn't know very much about the KHS when, when I went there and was just like so grateful for how welcoming and like enthusiastically supportive the KHS staff was, but also how collaborative you all are with the Filson. And like very early on directed me there and I went to the Filson and they were like equally as like welcoming and kind of seemed to be part of a, a common undertaking with you all, which I thought was very, very cool. Uh, and in a way is reflective of the early history of historical societies, where there was kind of a lot of sense of shared uh, participation in, in the work of building the, the nation's historical record. Uh, that, so that, that's one thing. The other thing is, I didn't know it was a Kentucky Derby, and uh, I, I like went to Kentucky and uh, was not prepared for that. And it was last summer, and it was like the I think the second or top greatest upset in uh, Kentucky Derby history when Rich Strike won. Um, and so uh, that that was that was an exciting, enjoyable, uh, noteworthy thing. I always joke with back. people as someone from outside the state is that I've learned so much about bourbon and horse racing, yep. um, both how bets are placed, how things work, horses. I mean, it is an interesting place in that sense, because where else do you get, you know, Derby Day? At? <laughs> 
all that goes with it and sort of the chaos of that. Yeah, I've, I've become a big booster for, for Kentucky over the past <laughs> year. So. Well, we appreciate that. I mean, it's great to have you back and to talk with you, but as always, yeah, it's, I think it's great for our fellows um, just, to, just to give you all a chance to talk to others and to give other people a sense of, okay, this is what the fellowship program does, how we bring in people, but also the very important research um, that can tend to get buried sometimes. I sure. Mean, you know, you've done articles and the, the challenge of getting that to the wider audience. So I, I do appreciate your well, joining think, us today. I do, yeah, not, not to put us over time, but I do think it's a great approach to thinking about what a research fellowship is, which often gets isolated to just, you go and do research by yourself. Yes. But, you know, by scaffolding it and giving it these other opportunities to, for people to express what they've learned and want to contribute, I think it's a great model for, for how this can happen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone at uh, KHS, too. The Kentucky Historical Society is thriving today, but we should not forget its early struggles. Although Edward Jarvis failed to convince many others that a historical society was necessary to preserve the state's history, he would later be vindicated. Today, the Kentucky Historical Society houses a large collection of manuscripts and objects that allow individuals to research and interpret Kentucky's rich history. For those interested in learning more about the early history of the Kentucky Historical Society, I encourage you to check out Derek's article in the register, which is available on Project Muse. This brings another episode to a close. I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Derek K. O'Leary, for talking with me today. Kentucky Chronicles is presented by the Kentucky Historical Society with support from the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Our show is recorded and edited by Gregory Hardison. Thanks to Dr. Stephanie Lang for her support and guidance. Our theme music is used courtesy of Pixabay. To learn more about our publication, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, or to learn more about our research fellows program, please visit our website, history.ky.gov. If you have enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe. It really helps us to know how we are doing. You can also help us build a following by telling your friends to subscribe.